This evening we're actually looking at a passage in um, Old Testament prophet, the last of the minor prophets, Malachi. And I'd like to read for you verses uh, 1 through 6 of Malachi chapter 3. Uh, the principle we're looking at is in verse 6 with regard to the unchangeableness of God. This is what we read in Malachi 3 beginning in verse 1. The Lord says, Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against those who swear falsely and against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, the widow and the orphan and those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Uh, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. I hope you recognize these words. It's actually a sung in the, uh, that uh, work, the Messiah. And a very important passage because um, this is an Old Testament prediction, a prophecy of something we've actually been studying the fulfillment of in John's Gospel. And we're going to see, of course, the fulfillment of other aspects of it later on. Uh, this messenger the Lord speaks of that he is sending to prepare his way was John the Baptist, the one God sent before his son uh, to clear the way or to prepare the way for his coming by preaching that doctrine of repentance, to get them to prepare their hearts to receive the Messiah who was coming behind him. Uh, Jesus is the one who is coming. Uh, notice that uh, in the first verse of Malachi, uh, chapter 3, he says, Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. You see, the one who is coming is the Lord. Jesus is the Lord in our nature. And we've already seen how he came suddenly to his temple, in John chapter 2, he cleansed the temple literally by casting out the money changers and those who were selling animals, those who were profiting by the worship of God. But he was also the one who would cleanse this temple spiritually, who would cleanse his own people by sacrificing himself on the cross so that their sacrifices, their praises and their thanksgivings might be made acceptable and pleasing to God. Now the Lord also in this text looks beyond these events to his judgment upon Israel for their sins, uh, not the least of which the crucifying of his son. The Lord wanted them to know in this passage that he was going to send his messenger and he was going to send his son in his mercy, that they might turn from their sins, that they might be saved, but that that mercy was going to be followed by judgment for those who would not receive him. But let's not uh, miss this point. He does end on an encouraging note, telling them that uh, really why his mercy was available to them. And again, that is in verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Israel, are not consumed. God had purposed to show at least some among the sons of Jacob, at least the true sons of Jacob, those who would trust in his son, his mercy from all eternity. This is something that he promised that he would do for all who would trust in him, something he would not fail to do because he never changes. And because he never changes, his purposes towards his people never change. Now this morning we saw that we can trust Jesus we can take Jesus at his word because Jesus is faithful, because he is trustworthy. Now this evening, what I want us to consider that that is true 
because of the character of God, because of the nature of God. Jesus is as he is because he is God in our nature. He is trustworthy because he is God, and as God, he cannot change. Whatever he has purposed, whatever he has promised, cannot fail to be true. So this evening, I really want us to consider two things. I want us to see that God can't change, and that's why we can trust his word, we can rely upon it. And secondly, because, well, because, actually, I've already given you both points. God can't change because he can't. You can trust him. So first of all, let's consider that God can't change. I mean, he says as much in our passage. And of course, if you already trust the word of God, and if you already know about the character of God, you know this is enough to settle the case. We, we saw in our meditation, God is not a man, that he should lie, nor a son of man, that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Our passage says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. God has has said it and God is true. He cannot lie. Therefore the case is settled. James tells us as much as well in James 1.17. Every good thing and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. And as I've already mentioned, because Jesus is God in our nature, the same thing is true of him. The author to the Hebrews actually takes what we read in Psalm 102 with regard to the unchanging nature of God, and he applies it to the Son of God. In Hebrews 1, verses 10 through 12, talking of the Son, he says, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they all will become old like a garment, and like a mantle you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will also be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. God doesn't change. With him there is no variation, there is no shifting shadow. And even though the heavens and the earth are going to grow old and like a garment are going to be changed, he is forever the same. Now, I've already mentioned that uh, the Bible tells us that we are like God in many different ways. Uh, we, We are spiritual. We have not only a body, but we have a soul because God made us that way. We That's part of the image of God. We can think. We can reason. We can make decisions. We have purpose. We are moral beings. We make moral choices. We have that capacity. And of course, we have purpose. You know, we we go after things, um, even as God does. In, In a certain sense, we are immortal, even as God is immortal, but only because that's what God has planned to do. He has planned that once we come into being, we will not go out of being. Now, the reason why we have this similarity to God is because we, among All the creatures, there's really only one other creature God has made that shares this in common with us. We are made in the image of God. The angels are the other creatures that God made that are also in his image. So there's many ways in which we reflect God. We are like him, that we might understand him, that we might have a relationship with him. But here is one way we are not like God. God never changes, but we do change. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus was famous for saying, you can never step into the same stream twice. And the reason you can't is because the stream is constantly changing, so it's not the same stream. But the thing is, the same thing is true of us. We are also changing constantly. We are never the same. But God never changes. And he doesn't change in at least three different ways. His being never changes. His character never changes, and his purpose never changes. Now, God's being never changes, and and here, you know, we we kind of push off into some deep waters when we're talking about God, and we talk about ways in which he is not like us. Um, A couple of things that, that, that are true about God that aren't true of us is the fact that he is eternal, and the fact that he is infinite, 
And both of these things imply that God really cannot change. Now, if something has a beginning, it also has an end, right? Everything that has a beginning has an end. That's true. But as it's moving from the beginning, from its creation, as it were, to its completion or to its end, it's constantly changing. That's true of everything that is made, everything that has a beginning, as it moves towards its end. But God doesn't have a beginning, you see. God is eternal. He has always been. And God has no end. He always will be. There is no process with God. There is no changing with God. He is always the same. His being, his substance as it were, his, you know, what, what he is, is always going to be the same. And the fact that he is not only eternal but also infinite also means that God does not change. God fills all existence. As a matter of fact, there's a sense in which, and this is kind of difficult to understand, but nothing exists besides him. God is the only thing that exists. We have sort of a derived existence that depends upon God, but we don't have our own existence within ourselves. If God did not hold us up, we would simply disappear into nothingness. Now what that means is because God is infinite and he is the only thing that really exists and he has been you know, this way throughout all eternity that there was nothing else but God for all eternity which means nothing else that would make him change, nothing to influence him in any way. There is just God in his perfect being who remains the same throughout all eternity. And even after he made what he made, and even though he has made all that he's made in this creation, as we look at the heavens and the earth, and even though this creation that he has made depends on him at every moment for his existence, or for its existence, God still hasn't changed. He still has just as much power as he had before he created the heavens and the earth. God could create a million more universes just like this one, and he could uphold them all with his mighty hand and still have the same infinite power to do all his holy will because God never changes. The fact that there's a creation now, the fact that there is this, this you know, thing that he has made that seems to have this derived existence, that doesn't limit him either. He's still just as infinite as he was before in his being and in his presence as he was before he created. In other words, the creation didn't change him. There is nothing before that could change him. God is forever the same and God is perfect. And being perfect in his being, there's no reason why God would want to change even if he could change. I realize again this is pretty abstract and esoteric as it were, but um, I just want to try to get a little bit of a point across that God's being doesn't change. And for those of you who are theologically minded and we think about some of the things that we understand about God, such as in the, in the Trinity, you know, we talk about the relationship that God has with the different persons of the Godhead throughout all eternity. And we talk about the eternal generation of the Son and we talk about the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit. Do these represent changes in God? I mean, does this mean that at some point God changed in some way? There was just the Father and then the Son suddenly sprung up and then the Spirit? No, because all of these things are eternal. God has never changed. When we talk about eternal generation, when we talk about the begottenness of the Son, we don't mean that, that God changed because the Son has always been begotten. He's always been the Son of God. It's always been a part of God's perfect nature and being to eternally beget the Son. We talk about the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit. We're not saying that God has changed. But it's been the eternal nature of God for the Spirit always to be proceeding. That too is a part of His nature. Which means that these three persons have always existed. And they have always had perfect fellowship with one another in this perfect being that we call God. That has never changed. And it never will change. So God's being doesn't change. Now that's going to mean a couple of things for us. For one thing, that means that he will always be able to do what he has purposed to do. Now the second thing is his character is something that will never change. 
His perfection extends beyond his, his being to his personality. God is perfect. He is perfectly holy. Holy is the word that really describes his perfection. And that holiness means that God has a perfect love for everything that is good, everything that is right. There is no sin in God. His eyes are too pure to look upon evil with favor. He hates everything that is contrary to his will. That's his nature. And if his character changed in any way, it would become less than perfect. And that's impossible. God will not change. His character will not change. And we need to be thankful that his character isn't going to change. Because that means, among other things, that God is not given to uh, passions. He doesn't go through mood swings like we do. God will never act impulsively or do things on a whim. We know all too well what we are like when it comes to that. We know that how we feel has a lot to do with how we respond to different situations. If we're irritated or frustrated or angry, we're far less likely to be patient or to overlook offenses as we should and far more, uh, far more likely to say things and do things that we know that we shouldn't do and that we're going to be sorry for later. And we know that when we're feeling good, when we're feeling happy, we're much more inclined to say things and to do things that we should be doing, the right things. But you see, God isn't like that. God doesn't experience these kinds of things. God never changes. He doesn't have emotions like we do that change. Now, I know sometimes it seems like God does have emotions. I mean, we see him on one occasion saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We see him delighting in his son or delighting in his people. We see this joy and this love of God radiating from him. But on another occasion, we see him bringing judgment against his people or telling Moses, step out of the way because I'm going to destroy my people for their sins against me. These are a stubborn and obstinate people. Now, does that mean that God is like us? Does that mean that God has mood swings and sometimes he's angry and sometimes he's loving and happy? No, but it does mean that that's the way he represents himself to us. He represents himself to us in ways we can understand. We call that anthropomorphism. He speaks to us as though he is a man or represents himself to us in terms that we can grasp. But you see, the problem is this. If God were to become angry then he would become infinitely angry. If he were grieved, he would become infinitely grieved because he's an infinite being. And if that could happen within God, then what would become of his infinite happiness? What would become of his infinite joy? Can these things all exist in God at the same time? I, I don't think so any more than they could exist in us. You see, God doesn't change, but man does change. Uh, the thing that's changing is man's relationship to God, and that's why we see the different facets of God in the, at these different points. His purpose to bless obedience is always the same, which is why when he looks at his son, he delights in his son. His purpose to punish disobedience is always the same. It never changes, which is why he expressed anger toward his people when they rebelled against him. He doesn't change but we change in our relationship to him. So when we move from obedience to disobedience, we see the face of God that is constantly against disobedience. If we happen to be unbelievers, we see his face of wrath. If we happen to be believers, we see his face of discipline. And when we move from disobedience to obedience, then we see his, his loving countenance, his, his face of, of blessing. And that's also why when we trust in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and when we're united to him, and when we're clothed in the perfect righteousness of Christ, when we look at God, we see the face of a smiling father who loves us because he sees us in Christ, and he sees us as having obeyed him perfectly. So we change, but God doesn't change. Uh, God's character is, is forever the same. Now, because the being of God never changes and he can always do his holy will, there's no lack of ability or power within God, and his character never changes, what he loves will always be the thing he loves, what he hates will always be the thing he hates. 
what he has purposed or what he has determined is never going to change. What God does in this world as he works out his plan, God has determined to do from all eternity. He has determined to do it with a perfect and comprehensive knowledge, with everything immediately before his eyes. God didn't sit down in eternity and say, you know what, looking ahead, I'm going to do this, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to, and this happens, I'm going to change this, and, and just kind of work it all through. There isn't sequence in God, there isn't change in God. There wasn't a time when he wasn't going to do this and now he is going to do this. But God's purpose is something that he is determined to do from all eternity. It's something that is as eternal as God is. It, it doesn't change. It's not something that he responds to as he looks in this world, see things happening. Well, oh, that happened, well, I better do this. If this happened, I better do that. But God saw all this, knew all this, and he knew exactly what he was going to do. Knowing everything that, that could happen, that could possibly happen in all the different realms of, of possibility, he purposed to let things unfold in the way that he did, determining to get involved at the points that he would in order to bring about a particular end. And this is simply to say everything is happening exactly as God wants it to happen. And it really couldn't be any other way. And the reason why we know that is because God could make it turn out another way if he wanted to, right? But it's turning out the way that it is, therefore God must want this. And since he has the power to change it and he doesn't change it, this is must, must be what he wants. God could change it if he wasn't happy with it, but God is having it work out the way that he does for his own purposes, for his own glory. It's exactly the way he wants it to be. If it wasn't, he would have done it some other way. Now that can be very encouraging for us because you and I often have to face situations that are outside of our control, but we need to realize they're not outside of God's control. Now, this week actually got to see this at work, got to see the principle at work, the acknowledgement of this principle and comfort that it actually brought to those who lost one very dear to them. And I'm talking about the Bush family with regard to, uh, to valor. I mean, how, how can we make sense of the fact that the Lord allowed valor to be born in the condition that he was born and that his life was as short as it was? Why? Was it that God didn't have the power to prevent this from happening? Now we already know that he has infinite power. God can do all his holy will. Is it that God isn't good and he struck Balor down in this way? No, of course not. The judge of all the earth will always do justly. He will always do what is good and always do what is right. And remember, the evil that's in this world is not his fault. It is the fault of the creature, even though he has allowed it to take place. Did this take him by surprise? Oops, I, I missed that one. And so it was outside of his control. No, God knows everything from eternity. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He planned everything that comes to pass. God is all powerful. God is good. God is in control. And yet this happened. Why did it happen? It's because of God's will. God determined that he would use that particular situation, that particular child with that particular condition for his good purposes. God uses the things that happen as a result of the fall. That we would call a natural evil that Valor would be born in, in that condition he was born in. And he even uses moral evil for his good purposes. Now God knew from all eternity that the fall was going to take place. And he knew that this would eventually mean that valor was going to be born in the condition that he was born in, and yet God allowed it to take place. He could have prevented it, but he didn't. He allowed it because of the good that he would bring from it. And by the way, God didn't make it happen. He saw that it would happen as a result of the fall, but he didn't do anything to prevent it. And so we asked the question, well, what possible good could come from this child's suffering and from his death? Well, if you were at the funeral, on Friday, you would have seen that there was a lot of good that came out of that. Um, you would have heard several testimonies. 
as to how the Lord used valor in the lives of many people. Several people got up, people that never knew the Bushes, people that got to know them at Davis Medical Center, people that were helping and supporting people in the community that got to, to know them through this, and how the Lord used valor in their lives to change their lives. He brought about things that could only have happened through that kind of a situation. God uses evil, in this case natural evil, not moral evil necessarily, for good ends. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that God even uses moral evil for good purposes. I mean, how did God save Israel from the famine that he was bringing on all the world? Well, basically, he allowed Joseph's brothers to hate him and want to kill him. And they were going to kill him, but they spared him and sold him into slavery instead. And that's how the Lord delivered Israel from the famine. How did the Lord glorify his name in the world through Pharaoh? Well, he allowed Pharaoh's heart to be hardened by his sins so that he wouldn't let his people go so that God could bring his judgments upon Egypt so that the world would know of his greatness and his glory. How did God bring salvation to the world. He allowed his own people, Israel, to hate his son and to turn against him and turn him over to the Romans for crucifixion, to nail him to a cross. God used the evil that came about from the fall, which came about from his creatures. He used it for good purposes. God's purpose, God's plan, what he has determined from all eternity is also something that is perfect and that's also why it will never change. God's not going to change it because to change it would be to make it imperfect. It's exactly what he wants. And by the way, let me just mention, God has not planned everything that he has planned for the well-being of the creatures. That's not why the world exists. That's what a lot of uh, ministers, well-meaning Christians might actually say, they might characterize it in this way, and, and when, you, when you say that's God's purpose and you look at what's taking place, you wonder, well, what went wrong? Why isn't it coming out that way? Well, it's because that wasn't God's purpose. God's purpose in making what he made was to reveal himself and to glorify his name and to show himself to the whole world and to show everyone what he is like. And that means that the things that are taking place now have to be taking place. What we need to be thankful for is that God in his plan, in his purpose, determined to save a people out of that pit that Adam dug for us. That he was willing to show his mercy and grace and to make us trophies of grace throughout all eternity. The reason why we have those blessings through his son, Jesus Christ, is because God determined to glorify his grace and to reveal his grace through the salvation of his people by giving that which was most precious to him. So that's God's plan, and we benefit from that plan because God determined to glorify his grace, and we need to be very thankful for that. Now, God can't change in his being. God cannot change in his character. God cannot change in his purpose. And that's why he pointed his people to this as their hope, as their confidence that everything was going to turn out well through Malachi, again, Malachi 3, verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. That's the reason why you and I aren't consumed, because trusting in Jesus Christ, we become the true sons of Jacob. We inherit the blessings through Jesus Christ, that's the, the only reason, the fact that God doesn't change, that's the only reason why you and I have a hope. And it's the reason, of course, why we can trust everything that he says. The reason that there is salvation in the name of Jesus Christ and that there always will be is because God never changes. And that's the only reason. The reason why God's never going to change his mind about you and the forgiveness that he's given to you and one day just decide to hold you accountable for your sins even after you've come to his son, it's because God doesn't change. What, what would it be like to have a capricious God who could change his mind at any moment and say, you're out? The reason why God's never going to grow tired of you and stop loving you and tell you to get out of his kingdom in one or two million years from now 
is because God never changes. The reason why God is going to work everything together for your good, everything that happens to you in this world and not let the world destroy you is because He never changes. The reason you can always rely on Him to carry through every promise that He has made in Jesus Christ is because He never changes. It's impossible for God to change. It's impossible that God should ever become incapable of fulfilling His promises to you because His being never changes. He is always going to have the power to be able to do this. He's not going to go out of existence. He's not going to lose power. He's not going to suddenly no longer be everywhere at once so that He doesn't see what's going on with you and doesn't know what's going, he's going on with you. God's not going to become senile. He's not going to forget what He has purposed to do because His being is never going to change. If He's made a promise God will make good on it because he will never lie. He's not a man that he should lie. His character is never going to change. So he's, he's not going to change his mind. And since he's eternally purposed to save you through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, it's impossible that he will ever repent and change his mind because his purpose for you will never change. Now again, this can be a tremendous comfort for those of us who have trusted Him because if you really love the Lord, that means that God has loved you throughout or from all eternity. That's not something He decided to do in time. That's something that He has always done. And He will never stop loving you because His love will never change. Just like everything else in God, it will never change. One thing that um, those of you who knew Dick Nielsen when he used to pray, it was almost every Sunday he would pray the same thing. You know, we, he, he, would, he would basically say that, well, he would thank God that his love for us would never end because it, it had no beginning. And that, as a matter of fact, is true. God's love for you is eternal. God's love for you doesn't actually begin when you repent and believe. That's when you realize for the first time that God does love you and that he always has loved you. That's not the beginning point. I do have to mention that, again, we understand the Bible to say that God doesn't, just doesn't love everyone indiscriminately and then just begin to want to pour out his wrath on them when they die. That's the way that many people represent the nature of God. He loves everyone. And yet when they die and he sends them to hell, even though he loves them in this world, apparently he doesn't love them in the next. But basically we're all God's enemies. We come into this world hating God and God's at war with us and yet we read in Scripture that there is this underlying and eternal love that He has towards those who are His sheep, those He sends His Son into the world to die for, those who will trust Him, those who will turn from their sins and believe on Him and only by His grace. Again, that's why I say God doesn't start to love you when you repent and believe. When you repent and believe, you begin to understand that He has always loved you. Now that's what the unchangeability of God means for us as Christians. God's being isn't going to change, His character isn't going to change, His purposes aren't going to change, and so His promises to you are yes and amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. He will never fail to follow through on them and you will have what He has promised for all eternity, a home in heaven. Now, if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, His unchangeableness means something else for you, doesn't it? Now, His purpose to bless those who trust in His Son are never going to change. Those who do are going to be blessed eternally. You will be blessed if you trust Jesus. He promises. That's true. But if you don't, you need to understand that he is just as unchangeably resolved to punish disobedience for all eternity if you die in your sins. The Bible says he will pour out his wrath on you forever because God is just and God cannot change. He's not going to change his mind and empty out hell at some time in the future. Those who go down into hell will forever remain in hell because God is just and he cannot change. Either Jesus pays for those sins or they have to pay for them. He offers Jesus to everyone, come to him, and he will have paid those 
uh, well, the payment for your crimes on the cross if you will come to him. But if not, you'll have to pay for them. And if you pay for them, you'll have to be in hell forever because you will never be able to pay for them. So know that the Lord is just as unchangeably resolved to punish sin as he is unchangeably resolved to bring his people to heaven and to bless them forever for the sake of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me just close by saying, if you haven't trusted him, may the Lord grant you grace to see your need and to put your trust in him, to turn from your sins and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that you might know his love, that you might experience his salvation towards you. The table reminds us this evening that there was no other way that God could reconcile his people. There was no other way he could save his people except through this payment. I just told you that if a person had to pay, if we had to pay for our own sins, we would suffer in hell forever. And the reason why we would is because we have committed sins against an infinitely holy and worthy God. We could never possibly satisfy for that kind of crime, there's only one person who could. And that person himself must be infinitely worthy to pay for our sins. And that's exactly what Jesus was and what Jesus is, infinitely worthy. He is God in human flesh. That is the only one who could have saved us. And it's the only one, of course, the Father knew could save us, which is why he gave us his son, in order to die on the cross to pay for our sins. So if you haven't trusted in Jesus... As you see the table this evening, you see what this represents. Remember that Jesus is the only way to escape what inevitably will happen to you if you do not turn from your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. God is unchangeably disposed to love those in his Son, but he is also resolved that he will punish those who don't love him forever. Trust in Jesus. Love him, turn to him, turn from your sins, believe on him, and you will experience his blessing and his love forever. Let's um, bow in a moment of prayer and let's, let's pray that God would help us to hear his word as we need to hear it.